then we should get started. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to uh, the Christmas Colloquium, the Astronomical Christmas Colloquium 2017. It is a great pleasure to welcome Tilman Denk from the Freie Universität Berlin, the Free University Berlin and DLR, who will be talking about Cassini at Saturn, mission accomplished. So what started almost like mission impossible is now mission accomplished. And um, let me start by saying a few words to our speaker. Um, Tilman Denk studied uh, Luft- and Raumfahrt, or what is it, aeronautics and uh, space technology in, in Stuttgart. Um, then he joined the DLR, the German Center for uh, Aeronautics and Space, in uh, close to Munich in Oberpfaffenhofen, but then discovered that they move further north to Berlin. So he moved with them, and he has been in Berlin most of the time since. Um, he first started out working on the Galileo uh, satellite system, and then in 1997 he started with Cassini. So he's a man of the first hour of Cassini, and um, so he's certainly one of those in Germany who knows this highly interesting mission the best. So we are very grateful that he could come to Heidelberg and give this Christmas colloquium. So um, in 2003, he uh, started a joint position at DLR and the Free University of Berlin, and this is where he's now today. So let us welcome our speaker, Tilman Denk. Okay, thank you very much, Herr Klessen. Um, okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I will talk a little bit about the Cassini mission to Saturn and the Titan mission accomplished. Maybe more correct would be data acquisition accomplished because the mission ended in, uh, in mid of September this year, but uh, there are so many data that we will need years and probably even decades until the real mission and the, uh, the look for the mission and the getting the information out of the mission will eventually be done. The picture that you can see here, <coughs> this is quite an old one. It was taken 20 years ago, a little bit more than 20 years ago during the launch. So what you can see there is the Cassini uh, spacecraft on a Titan IV rocket going uh, into the heaven of uh, Florida. This is a little bit closer from a distance where uh, only the automatic cameras are were allowed. And you can see here where the Cassini spacecraft is located. So a rocket is usually very high up to here. It's about 50 meters or so and up there, I don't remember, maybe 70 or so. So the Cassini spacecraft is here and this is a upper stage that brings the spacecraft away from the gravity field of uh, the Earth. Here, uh, when we go even closer then, this is just to give you a quick overview how the uh, Cassini spacecraft is organized. So you can see it's the same here. It's a picture of the spacecraft and this is a sketch. Uh, there it's only a little bit rotated. Here you can see this um, mock-shaped um, spacecraft. That's a subspacecraft called the Huygens probe, which had the task to um, to go into the atmosphere of the largest moon of Saturn, of Titan. And here you can see it also. So this one is just maybe 45 degrees or so rotated. Okay, so the, the big antenna on top, it has a diameter of about four meters. So that's the main, a main part of the system for the transmission of data and the, to receive data from Earth. Then you have, you can see here this ring, there are the computers therein. Also here shown here as the brains part. Um, other parts here, uh, these are the remote sensing instruments. You can see them here looking, maybe it, this is the camera, the, the, the narrow angle camera. That's a telescope of almost 20 centimeters um, aperture. So small for amateurs, but big for a spacecraft and also wide angle camera. And then there were also three spectrometers, one for the UV and uh, two for the infrared. Other components uh, quite important is uh, dust detector, but I'm seeking where this, I think it's there, this one here, yes, there, and there it's just on the other side. Um, this one was developed in Heidelberg, you know Heidelberg, I guess, um, from uh, at the Max Planck Institute by Professor Eberhard Grün, maybe some of you know him as well, and uh, it's now operated, I think, in Stuttgart from uh, one a colleague of me, Ralf Srama, maybe you know him as well. Um, 
Okay, this is a very important instrument because it made very important detections that I will talk about later. Uh, other parts are here, uh, these two nozzles, these are, uh, here it's called the walking lead. So that's the main engine that's for orbit trajectory changes. So if the spacecraft should go into a different orbit than it is now, then these might be used. But uh, they are rather weak, about 450 Newton or so, so it's only for small uh, maneuver corrections. If you want a big correction, then you have to do a flyby at the satellite Titan uh, with a maneuver called gravity assist that worked very well 126 times. Or if you come close to a planet like Venus, Earth or Jupiter, then it's uh, even better there. Then other parts, this one here is for the um, attitude control. It's like here, it's, uh, the analog is the dancing. And for attitude controls, there are also these parts. They are inside, uh, these are called reaction wheels. They are uh, turning very fast and when you accelerate or decelerate them, then the space shaft also begins to, tur uh, to turn. Um, the name of the spacecraft, Cassini and Huygens, it was uh, going back three centuries ago to Christian Huygens. He discovered the satellite Titan in 1655 and he discovered the true nature of Saturn's rings. Saturn's rings have been seen by Galileo in 1960, uh, sorry, in 1610, uh, uh, but he only saw, saw something that he called Anse, so I don't know the English word Henkel in German. And then Huygens, he realized what it is in 1656 and then he made something very strange. He put these uh, letters here in a row. Uh, it was called an anagram and then he said the solution of a scientific task is given in these letters but I'm not completely sure so if somebody else will announce in the meantime before I'm sure I can say I already was the person who has discovered it first and the meaning of this is, mean, uh, is it is surrounded by a thin flat ring that does not touch the planet and that is inclined against the ecliptic. And this is absolutely perfect definition for the rings. Giovanni Domenico Cassini, he was born in Italy, but then working at uh, Louis XIV in Paris. Therefore, his name is Jean-Dominique Cassini in French. He can be called the discoverer of the Saturn system. Uh, one discovery that he announced in 1677 is that the rings appear double. Um, he has seen an obscure line that separates the two parts of the ring. You can see this black line here a little bit and this is indeed uh, real and was later named the Cassini division of the rings. And he also realized the slight color difference between what was later called the A and the B ring. He said that the one ring, this one here, is a little something like matte silver and the other one, other one are more brownish silver. And that's also true. He also realized that this ring, this inner ring appears more clear and actually the main mass of the rings is within the B ring. So that was uh, very correct what he said. And he also discovered four satellites named Tethys, Dionoria and uh, Iapetus. And actually Huygens would have been able to discover them with this telescope, but at this time when he discovered Titan, then he said, okay, there are six planets, Mercury to Saturn, and now we have six moons, our moon, the four Galilean moons and Titan, so that's a nice symmetry, there exist no more objects. <laughs> um, so that was maybe the luck for Cassini then. And actually I think when I'm right, the moon Rhea, it was not just discovered at my birthday, but also when Huygens and Ole Römer and someone else were uh, with Cassini at the telescope. Okay, Cassini launched and this is now the trajectory that the spacecraft was doing. It had a total of 3.5 billion kilometers to Saturn or in the English language 3,500 million kilometers and the total travel distance was about 7.8 billion kilometers until Cassini ended a few months ago. Um, here you could see that uh, it did not move directly to Jupiter and then to Saturn, but first it went to Venus and made one of these gravity assist flybys. That means the spacecraft gets a big acceleration from the planet, while the planet gets a non-measurable deceleration from the spacecraft. And then it went up there, there was a maneuver it was about one and a half hours where these main engines were burning and then it gave only a little bit more speed. This was sufficient to go to Venus again in June 1999 and then the Venus and Earth were favorably placed. That was quite luck that it was this uh, way. So there was no need for another round and then going to a third flyby but it could do this directly so they saved maybe two years or so in mission time and the 55 days between the Venus swing by and one week after the solar, the total solar eclipse here, uh, that was the fastest travel ever between Venus and Earth that we had 
Um, then and Jupiter at the Millennium uh, flyby, uh, that was a very good opportunity to show uh, how the instruments work because when Cassini started the computers were quite empty. It was not able to take pictures or operate the instruments. The software was then developed and it was en route. And at Jupiter, it was argued that we have to test our software now, how the instruments work. And uh, for the scientists, this was of course an excuse to get uh, great pictures of Jupiter. Here you can see a movie um, taken every 9 hours 55 minutes so that the great red spot is uh, fixed at a fixed position because of course uh, it would rotate around as well. So you can see very nicely how the clouds are moving. And this one was from the distance of 10 million kilometers that uh, Cassini reached on December 30, uh, where it could observe uh, Jupiter and get very, in this case, a nice view of the uh, western side of the Great Red Spot. Due to the second Keplerian law, it took another three and a half hours. The Cassini came closer and closer to Saturn and then took every half year or so an image. This one was the first one. And when you look here at the shadow on the rings, then you can see that it gets longer and longer. This is because in, I think in 2002, it was somewhere, there was the summer solstice at the southern hemisphere of Saturn. And then uh, since the summer then progressed, then the shadow went, became longer and longer again. And in August 2009, there was then the next equinox. And then on July 1st, 2004, Cassini entered the Saturn orbit with another one and a half hour long burn. And since the travel time of the light is also one and a half hours, we could say when we saw the signal that the burn started, we knew that it has just ended, or we thought it has just ended. And then actually, it was really the case that it, everything went perfect and Cassini went into a first orbit around Saturn. And in case you wonder who made this picture, so it is just an animation, there was no other spacecraft to take such a picture. Um, I say this because I realized that there's sometimes a confusion uh, for people not knowing about this animation and what is not. So these are the orbits. Um, the terminus is petal blood. Petal means blüten blood. Um, this was because if you look at this, then it has the appearance a little bit of pedal, but Cassini now is so complicated that this analog might not fit anymore, but that's the name. And there was first a prime mission from 2004 to 2008. And uh, during this time, everything that was possible was uh, observed in the Saturn system. So the space came up here or here from this down here from Jupiter. And then the first orbit was the big one here. That's a distance of about eight to nine million kilometers to Saturn and all the other orbits were then no more than four million kilometers or most even two million or even closer at apoapsis and at periapsis it was mainly 200 to 500,000 kilometers something like that. Okay four years of orbits and then they realized we could not do anything that the scientists want to do therefore they decided to make a mission extension which was named the equinox mission because the equinox uh, day night on Saturn on uh, both uh, hemispheres were equally long um, because this fell into this time range 2009 and there it was interesting um, a phenomenon that is not very often it was not just fully funded as the full mission but uh, also people from the project were asking for two years and got two and a quarter years of uh, extension of mission but this was because then it ended somewhere in October where the fiscal year in the US ended also and then uh, this decision to make another extension now the money was cut somehow uh, and there were uh, two aspects in this. One was that the extension was for full seven years, which is really a lot. Uh, but on the other side, uh, the project uh, has promised that then they make a definite end of the mission. They will not ask for another funding after 2017. So it was a good deal for both. And then there's also the reason something that is called planetary protection. And the idea was because uh, it would not be nice to put Earth on bacteria somewhere on satellites of Saturn. So if the spacecraft is put into, a, into Saturn, then it's really gone away and all the bacteria that might still have survived are died. The other option would have been to remove it from the Saturn system, to go to Uranus or so, but to Uranus or Neptune. But arriving there at my 100th birthday didn't appear appealing. So this just illustrates also um, how the seasons how uh, the seasons are um, and set up. So arrival in Ju uh, July 2004, so this was a little bit before, in, in the southern hemisphere 
uh, well, summer solstice in the northern hemisphere winter and then the equinox then in 2009 and the idea of the solstice mission was to go through the whole spring in northern hemisphere of Saturn and of the satellite Titan to observe changes that are related to the seasons. So, okay, next part, the Cassini science fields. Um, you might do a full colloquium on each of these, probably, but I only get about 50 minutes today, so I have to concentrate a little bit, and I will concentrate on the satellites, mainly on the uh, icy moons, Enceladus and Iapetus in particular, and also on the outer irregular satellites, because this was my field that I am working since a few years, and also uh, still today for the next two years. Since the announcement of this talk also spoke about giant storms and complicated rings, I also have to give a little bit on these two here. Maybe I start immediately. Oh, I forgot something. Yes. Um, Cassini is a higher legende Wollmilchsau. Um, I don't have a good uh, translation. Swiss Army Knife, I was finding here, and said, this is why I show this picture. Maybe this is what Cassini is for the Saturn system. There are 12 science instruments, and the Huygens probe has six instruments. So, this um, is a really, a really good spacecraft that made a really good job. And doing it this way is the right way to do uh, spacecraft planetary missions, not doing a focus observation on one or two aspects of the system. This really doesn't work or isn't really appealing. So, okay, the giant storm. Here is the giant storm. As you can see, on December 5, an infrared spectrometer saw a, a temperature increase of about 80 kelvins. Um, the radio signs saw a large <laughs> signal, whatever this means. And uh, then two and a half months later, it was really a giant storm and it expanded already about half of the planet. And then somewhere in August, uh, the Q, the end of the a storm reached the, uh, the front here and then the storm faded and disappeared. And this was not the first time that such a storm was observed, it was actually the sixth time already. Here I compiled um, observations that were done before. It also shows a little bit the progress of uh, imaging in planetology. So this is still, these are drawings and then this is a photograph here, also another photograph. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope before it got his, uh, the, the glasses and this now from Cassini. And usually this storm appears every 27 to 30 years, but in the case of Cassini it already came after 20 years and also during a time where the spacecraft was in the equator plane of Saturn, so that the rings were not in the view of the, uh, the spacecraft and it could do very nice observations. So I don't know why Saturn cooperated this way, because it doesn't sense it as a spacecraft, that it was a good thing. And uh, it will be interesting if someday somebody will have a theory or hypothesis why this now happened after 20 years and not after 27 to 30. So, the rings, they are really marvelous and also impressive uh, feature. The width here, what you can see from the edge of the A ring down to the inner D ring, that's about 60,000 kilometers. And when you take whole Saturn from here, then it's about 273,000 kilometers. So, imagine the Earth is here, our Moon would be there, and Saturn would just fit there in between. The thickness, this is approximately, if you have a sheet of paper of the size of a soccer stadium, uh, so that's approximately the relations. Here we have 45 again, either billion or thousand billion square kilometers. That's the area of the rings. And uh, a few days ago, I checked what is the area of the Saturn sphere, and I, I saw it's 43. So it's quite equal. So the rings have the same uh, area approximately as the. Uh, as the sphere of Saturn. And but if you take the other one also as an area, then you can say it's even twice the area that the rings have compared to Saturn. And there are some people in the US and I think also in Germany who think that the Earth is a flat uh, body. And maybe we should send them to Saturn and say it's not completely flat, but two thirds are flat and one third is only sphere. So there the theories are right. Um, this is one of the more recent pictures. Uh, the details that you can see are only three kilometers, but you can see that the rings are really complex. And people who like mathematics and fluid dynamics and um, thermodynamics and things like that, they are really happy when they are, can work with this um, area. Um, I will not say a lot of this, just one wording that I a very uh, nice former team member, uh, André Barrique was his name, he was working in Paris, unfortunately he died uh, a year ago, and he made this quotation about the ring, so he was a really passionate uh, ring scientist. 
Uh, rings are like a woman's perfume. They have a small mass, but they hold a lot of information. And that's actually true. So each band that you can see, it has some gravitational reason somehow because an object is doing a 36 to 35 or something like that resonance or something like that. So each uh, little part of the ring has uh, its own reason. One particularly nice um, image of the rings is this one. It was taken close to Equinox and here on this sketch here you can see where uh, the image is located. So it's at the outer edge of the B ring. There you can see the Cassini division here and there it's interesting. This is a two to one resonance to a larger moon named Mimas. And, uh, this resonance it uh, has the effect that the particles pile up to vertical structures up to two and a half kilometers high. This could be measured from the length of the shadows here because the sun was uh, striving here uh, almost uh, parallel to the rings. And this is really impressive. So in case you ever plan to uh, open a travel agency and offer travel to Saturn, then hovering around this area here and uh, enjoying the nice view, that would be one of the prime um, advertisements that you can do there. Okay, now let's go to the moons. Um, the official count currently is 62, while our Earth has only one if the uh, International Space Station is not counted because it's artificial uh, and the ring particles are not counted as well so it would be billions then and you could not really take track of them. Uh, this is not to scale so Titan is much bigger it actually uh, it has I think more than three quarter of the surfaces of all the moons and then there are six uh, little bit smaller moons and then many much smaller moons. In case there's someone in the audience with a photographic memory, um, please identify yourself at the end of the talk and re repeat this view graph. Um, they are listed 55 and as you can see not all have names and those who are missing are also moons uh, with no uh, names so far. And the reason is because their orbits are not really well determined and they might even be called effectively lost. Um, we should, they really have to be seeked again within the hill sphere of Saturn, so that's the area where satellites can exist. You can also see a separation here, 3.6 million kilometers and then 11.4, so that's the semi-major axis of Iapetus and of Kiviuk. And those below here and on this side, these are the so-called irregular moons or outer moons. Um, Except for Phoebe, which was discovered in 1899, all have been discovered between year 2000 and 2007. So they are quite new and uh, the realization that more irregular than regular moons exist, uh, it is quite new, just two decades uh, approximately. But these are the regular ones, the blue ones are the large ones or medium sized and the yellow ones are the smaller ones. And as I said already, this um, question, what is called as a moon, that's a little bit difficult and the number is really what is a moon because on the one hand in 2016 and 17 there were six objects discovered by a group in London from Queen Mary uh, University and uh, one of them is shown here, so this square shows here, so you can see there's an object close to a, a dusty ring called the F ring uh, that is outside the A ring, the A ring is here. Um, and this one is not officially counted, although it is there, but maybe it's a transient object, so it's really difficult to say. On the other hand, this object here, S2009 S1, it was discovered within the rings, so you can see where it is here, and it was only seen because the sun was uh, shining edge on on the rings and because the shadow uh, tells us where the object is. Um, and it has a diameter of maybe one or two kilometers, something like that. And it's pretty sure that you could not find it anymore. If you send a spacecraft there again, you have to seek for it before finding it. Maybe it does not even exist anymore. Um, then there were some uh, discoveries of moons that were done by the Cassini spacecraft, but these are real moons. Uh, here's a compilation of them. Uh, objects like Mephone or Paline, they have, uh, they look like a chicken egg, a little bit, three kilometer size, so it's really flat, it's strange, it's probably an assembly of very loose material, like a snowball. And Polyduces is maybe somewhat similar. Daphnis is interesting because it's within a very small gap. The object itself is about seven kilometers, the gap is 42 kilometers, and it causes waves, as I will show this later in the image. Ante is a, a friend of these two, and then Egeon, this is a really uh, peculiar object. Uh, these are all quite bright, so reflectance of maybe 60, 70, 80 percent, but Egeon has 10 percent or maybe even less. It creates a very faint dusty ring, and it has a size that might be three times in one direction uh, compared to the other direction, so a little bit uh, rem uh, reminiscent to this interstellar asteroid that was discovered two months ago. Um, I will take this um, 
to say a little bit about my roadmap and why I can give you this talk. I, I have some information that you might not have so far. One is um, when we had a teleconference with colleagues from the Cornell University in 2000, these eight moons that are listed here, they had to be divided, which group is planning which one. And then we agreed that the Cornell colleagues are doing Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys and Hyperion, while we at Berlin, we are doing Dionyria, Iabetus and Phoebe, and we that meant, meant mainly me and a colleague at DLR. And then I started to think how can we observe these objects best? What would be the good strategy? How do we are we doing the targeted flybys? And um, what are with color observations? How with photometry, different phase angles, all this stuff. So I was thinking about this and then putting in the system and uh, developing a plan for them. And for these objects, the irregular moons, uh, they were discovered in 2000. And then um, one day I was thinking, I realized that Vesla was coming very close to Iapetus, it's only about 3 million kilometers. I thought, do they have the same color? Maybe material from Vesla is causing a color dichotomy and a brightness dichotomy on Iapetus. So I didn't put out my cell phone. <laughs> um, okay, and um, it didn't work to measure the color exactly, but uh, I developed a complete plan to observe these, ob uh, these objects. And th th there's a total of um, 443,186 pictures that were done with Cassini and where the pictures came to Earth. And from these, I was responsible for about 13% of them. And from these, about two thirds were actually covering these irregular moons because one cannot see them as uh, disks, but when you observe them for hours and hours and hours, then you can uh, get light curves. I will show this in the next few view graphs. This first shows uh, how the uh, objects are how you can imagine a little bit. So it looks very fuzzy there, but actually the distances of uh, about 30 million kilometers from here, Saturn center to here, from the edge. So, and the object sizes, it's only about 40 kilometers and then it quickly goes down below 10 kilometers. And the smallest that are known from the 38 that are known at the moment are only three kilometers in size and there are certainly a few hundred or even more that are larger than one kilometers that have not been discovered so far. From these uh, nine are known that are in prograde orbits that this means the same uh, this direction sense as the regular moons while 29 so it's even the majority goes in the wrong direction so when you look from north the retrogrades go with a counterclock direction while the prograde go sorry the prograde go clockwise and the uh, pro the retrogrades go okay. The retrogrades go clockwise, and the prograde's go counterclockwise. Um, this is another way to watch this. So this is the semi-major axis here in this polar plot, and there is the inclination going up to 90, and then the retrogrades are counted from 90 to 180, which is again the plane of Saturn's orbit around the Sun. The dots here show where the objects are located. So uh, semi-major axis and then the eccentricities are shown with the bar so you can see that there are quite large eccentricities which go somewhere from 0.1 to 0.5 so that's relatively large. Um, there are still dash lines here they show apparent boundaries so at high inclination this doesn't work because then there's the orbits are unstable the objects would either escape or crash into the inner system and then why this uh, boundary is we have no idea why the inclined orbit the high inclined um, are closer to Saturn than the lowly inclined. And then you can see these blue circles. This indicates potential families. So it's possible that this was originally one orbit that was then destroyed through a, uh, an impact. And then uh, many objects, the debris, so to speak, was created and they share similar orbital elements. Also here and there, there are two objects. If, if these are two, then it might also be possible that they were only gravitationally related and later separated, but that's not clear so far. And then you can still see this yellow band here. This is, the, so to speak, the sphere of influence of Phoebe. So Phoebe, as you can see, is much bigger than the other, others, and this means also that Phoebe is really the boss. You see that here these retrogrades, they are all keep a respectful distance and only dip during their periapsis a little bit into the realm of Phoebe, but for most of the time during their orbits, which are between one and a half and four years around Saturn, they uh, stay out of the area where Phoebe is moving. And there was a study from 2003, and this uh, study showed that every object that's, that uh, tends to, um, to come close to Phoebe, there is a collision rate over 
the life of the solar system of 0.2 or even larger. So many of them were just lucky. And these here, they are, these are very brave objects here. Um, yeah, the collision rate was even calculated to 1.2 approximately, so it's not likely that they will survive another 4.5 billion years in, uh, without crashing into Phoebe. Uh, but uh, usually the, the room where Phoebe is moving, uh, there is are not a lot of other objects. And it's also interesting, the 220 kilometers or 213, it's quite large, but it's still very small compared to the ability to uh, scatter objects. So uh, when an object is going close, even just one kilometer uh, uh, distance to the surface of Phoebe, then you still don't have a very high inclination change or, or orbit change. It's a bending is then still less than one degree. So scattering is not happening. It's just either collision or luck. Okay, this is how Phoebe is looking like. There was a flyby in 2004 when Cassini was approaching uh, Saturn and uh, the space shuttle came as close as 2,070 kilometers and it looks um, very cratered and there you can see this is a very large crater, about 100 kilometers in size and maybe this is one of the craters where the other irregular moons uh, were taken off. So if there was an impact then a lot of debris was going out and it might be possible that the other irregular moons formed from this impact or at least some of them. Okay, that's one of the pictures from the other observations. Here you can see four kinds of um, dots. Then what is going up and down, these are the stars, like this one here, that move through the field of view. Then what is uh, stable here, this is hot pixels in the camera. Then what is uh, flickering, that's uh, cosmic rays, protons or electrons in particular. And then there's one object that makes the left-right movement a little bit. This is the object that we want to observe. In this case, it's um, Kiviuk, and when you look for the light curve, then you can see this is the magnitude. Kiviuk has a very extreme uh, light curve. It goes, uh, if it's a relative, this is arbitrary 0, 0.0, then it goes up to two magnitudes darker after a quarter of the rotation. Then after three quarters, it's not that dark, but also still dark and then uh, again brighter. And when you look at it, then you can also see that it, now it gets a little bit darker here now and now it gets brighter again. This is just when it's go through here. Usually you cannot see this with the uh, naked eye, but you can measure it. And measuring this light curves uh, then has a lot of information. In the next view graph, which is a little bit bright, um, here you can see Kiviuk again, and these are from 25 uh, satellites where I was successful to measure light curves. And you can see that they look quite different. So here, the Kiviuk style, they are relatively similar to maxima to minima, which are relatively um, clear. But here in the top row, for instance, here you have even three maxima and three minima, and this indicates that these objects should have a very different appearance. For these two, we already uh, got uh, model shape models, uh, but only convex shapes, so we cannot see craters or concavities, but um, uh, they both look a little bit like a triangular prism, so that's very different, while Kiviuk probably either looks like a very elongated ellipsoid or it might even be possible that this is a double object. And there we have the mixed forms and uh, the data um, looking for the data and analyzing them is still in progress, so I hope that in half a year or a year or so that we can say about a lot more objects what the shapes of them are. We think that all of these objects, all of these light curves are uh, shape driven, so this means having at least two maxima to minima. Here we see the, the bright, uh, the, the the big size and side, and here we see the small side. While one object, Phoebe, it is albedo driven so that its brightness differences on the surface ice that is excavated, which shapes the light curve here. It might be possible that for some of the other objects it's also the case, but we have no indications for this yet. We are asked for the typical rotation periods. Here they are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, uh, we also got for them uh, rotation periods, just these two are uncertain, these two are a little bit uncertain, and um, so they range, as you can see, from five and a half hours to a little bit more than three days. And this is interesting in several, for several reasons. One is if you're interested in numbers per se, then it's already interesting, but also that for asteroids, about one third of all main belt asteroids that are known uh, in this diameter size from 4 to 45 kilometers, except for Phoebe, which is larger, um, about one third are rotating faster. Asteroids go up to 2.2 hours for one rotation. And so this means this must be meaningful somehow. It is not just coincidence. Uh, and 
the most likely case that you think is that these objects have a much lower uh, bulk density than the main belt asteroids I have. What would mean that their origin is not the asteroid belt but rather from the outer solar system. What is also interesting here when you see the green uh, are the prograde, the red are the retrogrades. Why are the prograde the small, the slow one except for these two and why are the retrogrades the fast rotating one except for these two. I have no idea about this. If someone of you have, then I'm open to write it in a paper. <laughs> and also interesting is this number here. Uh, we got this at a good accuracy of about half a percent or so, and it is only 0.4 hours away from one-fifth of the rotation of Titan, the big satellite. So there might be a correlation to this that the gravity of Titan made a little bit of an influence to this object. I have an American colleague who can check and calculate this, but he's very busy and uh, I hope he will do this rather sooner than later to find this out. Okay, back to this view graph. You can also see that the prograde objects are on average much closer. Only these two retrograde objects are closer to Saturn and all the other retrogrades are further away. So we have the situation. Prograts are much closer to Saturn than the retrogrades on average. For the orbit tilt, you cannot see this, it's the same. The prograts are all at 34 degrees inclination or higher, while only two of the retrogrades have that high tilt. And then also with the um, correlation with the period, and the physical reason uh, why the prograde objects are on average closer to Saturn on higher inclined orbits and slower rotations, we don't know so far. Okay, then let's move to the bigger objects where you can really see the surfaces. Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea and Iapetus and I also include Hyperion because it looks very funny. Uh, from Voyager, it was already known. Voyager was a space shuttle in 1980 and 1981 who made flybys at Saturn just going in and going out. And they were also taking low resolution images of the moons and it was already known from then that uh, Mimas crater on Herschel, the Tirava basin on uh, Rhea and the Odysseus Basin on Tethys, they were observed, but now from Cassini we learned that all of the satellites have giant structures somewhere, so it seems to be a property of the satellites to have uh, giant impact basins. So I have to even have a few, you can see there are even two that one is uh, erasing most parts of the other one. For the larger moons like Dione and Rhea, you can see that they look quite similar to our moon. So if you could show an expert an image and say, is this the moon, then he would at least say maybe. So some, for Mimas it already looks a little bit different. There you can see this boundary here in the craters, the dark material seems to have been moved down. So this is somewhat a similarity still. Also these objects are completely made of ice with only minor impurities like silicate or carbon. On Dione we also have some areas that are tectonically um, shaped, that, as you can see here. So this is something that we don't have on the moon and also this shape of the crater. They look a little bit like pans, have a very steep slope here on the wall and then they are flat there on the bottom of the crater. Then Hyperion, I mentioned, it looks like a sponge and it might even be a sponge in the sense that the density is only about half of the density of water, it's 544 plus minus 50 plus minus 50 kilograms per cubic meter. And that's a really strange surface that we don't know on the moon or somewhere in the inner solar system. And when you go closer then you can see how strange it looks. So it appears that the dark material is loose and was then moving into the craters for whatever reason down there. So then I go to Iapetus, an object where I was also working a little bit for uh, a while ago. It is the third largest moon, close to Freya, which is the second largest, about the same size. It's the outermost of the regular satellites and as you can see it looks very strange. So it's um, a little bit like a, a motorcycle helmet. So you have the visor here, here the hinge, the hard parts down here. And what's also interesting and very important for this feature is that the orbit period of 80 days is the same as the length of the day-night cycle which is also 80 days. So it has what is called synchronous rotation, that is what our moon is also doing, 29 and a half days or so. And um, it's not clear how Saturn made this to slow down Iapetus rotation but it did and so it's one of the longest uh, day-night cycles that we have in the solar system. Not the longest but uh, maybe within the, the best 20 or so. This um, feature was known since 
Cassini, now the man, the namesake of the spacecraft, in, uh, he realized this in the 1670s and published this in the Journal des Savants in 1677. So it was uh, the major scientific publication journal of the new periodicals that were existing just uh, two decades at this time. And also 10 days later in the English equivalent in the Philosophical Transactions. And here is a sketch how you can imagine how it is. So it's the front side that is dark and then the this is the sub-Saturn side, the anti-Saturn side, so Saturn is in the middle, and this is the trailing side, so if you imagine you go in a roundabout with your car, so then that's the trunk and that's the motor side here, and that's the driver's side, and that's your wife's or husband's side. And so Cassini has seen Iapetus, he only saw it as a dot, and he, but he saw it only on the one side of Saturn and never on the other side, and then he claimed correctly uh, what is given here in yellow. Uh, this means, but it seems that one part of his surface is not so capable of reflecting to us the light of the sun, which maketh it visible as the other part is. And this is absolutely right. He is also ruling out that the elongation of the object or that solar illumination also might be the cause. He claims this is the cause and this is absolutely true. It remained true, but unexplained for three centuries and then it was maybe the second longest unsolved enigma in planetary science. Maybe Older was still the origin of the rings. And this ended then uh, with our spacecraft Cassini then when uh, we had an article in Science in 2010 about the formation of Iapetus extreme albedo dichotomy by exo genically triggered thermal ice migration. So this is the recent sublimation of water ice plus numerous boundary conditions and I just um, write them down here. So it's Iapetus has really a lot of properties that make it exactly right for this task. So it has the right size mass, meaning that the water ice, the sublimes, does not escape but does not also not uh, be redistributed locally. So it can move globally, but does not really escape. Or then the distance to the sun, it has the right temperature there. So it's uh, other satellites have minus 180 degrees. And uh, for Iapetus, since it rotates so slowly, it goes higher. It goes up to uh, something like minus 130 or something like that. And this is then the right temperature where the water ice can sublime at a a significant um, amount of material. And then there's also the existence of these outer retrograde moons that I have described uh, just uh, ago, a while ago, and uh, they deliver some dust that they lose from micrometeorite um, um, bombardment. And this lost material, Iapetus is the first obstacle, and it samples, so this means that Iapetus has an a priori difference in albedo already. And we can also measure this, that there's also a fuzzy boundary, not such a sharp boundary that we have seen. And so all these uh, boundary conditions come together and explain how uh, by thermal migration, this strange appearance, which is the only object in the solar system that looks like a uh, motorcycle helmet, except some of on Earth, the, the, the real helmets. So this is a close-up picture of Iapetus from the flyby in 2007 that I was responsible for. Um, there you can also see this sublimation. So you can see that on the crater rims, this dark material, uh, it all points approximately in the same direction. So it's hard to see here, but it's the equator board direction. So it's like here, uh, the wine yards in this uh, area of Germany here, um, you always find, uh, you, you always plant the wine on uh, the equator facing uh, parts of the hills, or maybe the people would say on the southern hills, but here in this case, since we're on the southern hemisphere, so it's in the northern, northern well, pointing areas of the craters. And there are also here, you can see that what is pointing to the south, uh, to, to, the, to the pole, this is there still black off, or the surroundings are already dark. So that's really um, a good uh, proof for the thermal migration to be acting on this object in a large scale. Another interesting thing that was discovered on Iapetus is the equatorial ridge. And this is very interesting for several reasons. It's not just an interesting geological feature on the surface, but it also goes exactly on the equator, meaning that it's also a geographical landmark on the surface, a natural geographical landmark. And another interesting thing is that it's not really clear how it formed. There were people that are thinking it was tectonically formed, maybe that there was some upwelling here and then it was going up. But this is a little bit strange because it should see 
see this on other planets or objects as well in this case, but it's, this does not happen on others than on Iapetus. So there came the idea that Iapetus once was owning a ring and that the ring materials were falling down. It's strange to believe this, but there's no better idea so far. During the only targeted flyby in 2007, we also came very close to Iapetus and uh, I was very proud about this picture here because that's, uh, I think, one of the nicest pictures that we produced uh, with the Cassini spacecraft during the 13 years of mission. And it was e even inspiring an artist who was writing a book about, with the title, Living Among Giants, Settling, Exploring and Settling the Outer Solar System. And there he had a colleague who designed a Greek mountain uh, village and put this on Iapetus here inside. And uh, since we have Christmas a few days, then I, that was my addition here. That's not, not from the book there. So if you want to go to the tourists and uh, organize travel to Saturn, again, another possible idea. So in case you found all this, what I said so far, interesting, then I will show you something that is even more interesting. And this is Enceladus. It's a relatively minor satellite, just 500 kilometers, but it's the star among the satellites of Saturn. And I guess most of you already heard about it and you probably know what uh, the real good thing on uh, Enceladus is. Um, you see that it not just looks different, so it's much more smooth. The surface, the craters look more um, um, uh, lost a little bit, so um, so they like like if the, the ice below cannot hold them, so they they sink down and disappear more or less. So there are even areas with no craters at all. And then there are these four uh, scratches here, which will dub the tiger stripes. They are on the south pole, south pole, somewhere here, and these are areas of extensive um, volcanism. You can see this here, that is one of the last observations, and there you can see on the south pole there's something going on here. Um, this is the light of the sun, that's overexposure, and what you saw just disappearing, that was the light of Saturn, so the Saturn shine here, and we are at a high phase angle, this means that we are in the back reflectance light. Uh, it's like the dust on a window, then um, if you are in a, maybe in, in a house where male students are living and look on the windows, then you can probably also see this kind of uh, structure when the sun is coming in there. And so Enceladus loses material for the whole time, whenever you look at it, there's material going on. It's uh, the terminus is the plumes uh, for this structural habitus uh, on Enceladus. And um, there were many um, science done with this, and one colleague, Doug Hemingway is his name, he determined from all the data that Enceladus should have a rocky core with a radius of radius of approximately 192 kilometers and a density of 2450 kilograms per cubic meter so this is rocky more or less and then the final 60 kilometers up to the surface that should be h2o in a mix of ice and water we know that there is water because we have the plumes and so the idea is that there is a water hydrosphere or ocean everywhere but the thickness of the ice shell is different so there at the equator it's a little bit thicker, on the pole it's thinner, and there on the south pole it's so thin, 12 kilometers, or it might even be only 2 kilometers, we don't know. Um, it's so thin that the water pressure can bring out uh, the water uh, and it finds its way through cracks uh, in the ice shell and that we can see the plumes and also explore and examine them. This model implicates that the amount of water is about 10 million cubic kilometers there. This is about 100 to 150th of the Earth's oceans, maybe about the, the size of the Arctic Sea approximately. That's the amount of water that is there. And the really interesting thing is not just that there is water somewhere else uh, in a reservoir, somewhere else in Earth, but that this water also has contact to a siliceous core and from the dust that is coming out of the plume, there were also uh, silica measured uh, in a specific um, amount and um, uh, mass ratio and um, concentration and so on. And also H2 was measured, so hydrogen, and uh, from 
combining all these um, results, it was determined that the pH value should be about 11 to 12 and that there should be hydrothermal vents at the ocean floor, either in the past or maybe even today. And here from Earth, we know that hydrothermal vents are also existing in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for instance, and that there is a rich amount of biological activity. So it's indeed possible that Enceladus holds biological activity in his, its interior, in the mantle, and uh, that Enceladus is actually now the hottest place outside the Earth to seek for life that is not uh, living on Earth. That Enceladus has bloomed, we might already have known before the spacecraft started, because in the gardens of Versailles from uh, Louis XIV, there is this uh, basin of Enceladus, and the fountain is about 25 meters high. So this is from the, uh, the Greek uh, mythology where the giants were losing again the titans, and the ti uh, giants were then uh, put in the earth. Uh, I think Enceladus below Etna or so, and sometimes Etna is uh, uh, spewing, spewing fire, and so this is the, the Greek idea that there's a giant sitting there and then moving, and he, because he doesn't like to be present there in the earth. Okay, that was the mid-sized moon. Let's now go to the giant moon, to Titan, where Cassini made 126 close flybys. And um, in 13 years, and Huygens was doing just the landing. And there is a comparison of the mass. So Titan has 96%, while all the other satellites have 4%. So it's a really important object. The problem with Titan, which has an atmosphere of 96% of uh, Nitro, uh, nitrogen, 3.5% methane, and half percent others. And it's also the only moon in the solar system with a developed atmosphere. And the problem of this atmosphere is that we cannot look through, so we cannot see the surface. Here you can also see that uh, when the sun is behind or a little bit above Titan, uh, the atmosphere is bending the light a little bit. Um, but there is a chance to look. One of uh, possibility is using a radar, radar instrument that was Cassini doing, and the other is also some infrared filters somewhere at 940 nanometers. And there you can see when the red is replaced by the infrared that you can see just there is something going on in the surface. So these are have a found to be dune areas. The dunes are on the surface, especially on the equator. There you can see clouds here. Uh, minus 180 degrees, so there's clouds that are carrying methane and there's raining liquid methane and there are actually even seas and lakes here um, that are far in the north, lakes of liquid methane and nitrogen. This is a radar image of one of the lakes, uh, Ligeia Mare, it's the second largest, this is about one third of the size of Germany only 150 meters deep and the waves might be very very flat, less than one millimeter. This is the composition and here you can see uh, how uh, my colleagues think that the depth of the lake is located. So the deepest part here, 150 and then they're even more shallow. There is a uh, lake district, about 97% of all lakes are located within an area uh, that is about twice the size of Germany and which covers about 2% of Titan's surface near the North Pole. So North Pole is here and there you can see Ligeia Mare here and here is Kraken Mare and also others and here is a, a lake district and the only lake that has a German name that is the Mügellacus which is located here. But this Mügellacus is much larger, about 100 kilometers or so while ours in Berlin is only 3 to 5 kilometers. And you see, these ones are darker than this one, so I'm not really sure if it's really a lake or rather something where only mud is there. So, and really funny was the Huygens landing, it's already 13 years ago now, um, on Titan, where the spacecraft, the Huygens spacecraft, which was built from the European Space Agency, was separated, and then after 22 days of silent fly by, uh, flight, uh, it Again, transmission when it entered the atmosphere of Saturn. And this is an example of an image mosaic. So this Titan, uh, the Huygens spacecraft was flying here on a, uh, on a parachute, you can see here, and then it went here, the points show when the pictures were taken, and then it moved here, driven by the winds, and then very close to the end, it moved back in the western direction and landed here on this plane, which is, has a darker um, albedo. And here you can see this uh, dendritic uh, features there, that was very obvious. So this was the first clear evidence that liquids are moving on the surface of Titan. So it's a little bit like in Arizona where you have the dry beds and maybe once or twice a year the heavy rain is coming down and then forming over millions of years uh, these uh, river beds that you can see here. And then the methane that was raining down ended here 
on the uh, lowlands and then disappeared somewhere in the underground or maybe evaporated. Huygens survived the impact on the ground. It was a 16 g acceleration and this was then the image. Um, here's how you can imagine because the camera is about the height of your knee or so where it was located on the surface. So it's really close here. This, uh, uh, pebbles are maybe 10 centimeters or so in size, they are made of ice. Um, it was only a uh, black and white camera, so this is uh, artificial color. And then it sends still data for about one hour approximately, and then it faded as you can see. Um, and except for changes in the JPEG pattern of the uh, compressor, and then sometimes you see a bright flash, this is because there was a lamp on board for giving the uh, space shaft a white light for the spectrometer here at Wasser, but otherwise you cannot see anything there, so there are no, uh, no plants around there, no trees, some, uh, almost no trees somewhere, no birds flying and no kangaroo, and so things like the Titan appears to be a dead world, what is not unexpected. So, okay, this is now the last few months of the mission and I see that I take much more time than I was okay, but he says it's okay, thank you. <laughs> um, they were called the Afring and Proximal Orbits and the Proximal Orbits, they were later renamed to Grand Finale. This is showing um, how it works. So Cassini was on an inclined orbit about 63 degrees, degrees inclination and then a flyby at Titan. It brought the periapsis very close to the ring only 10,000 kilometers or so uh, above the A-ring. And this was done 20 times and then was the very last Titan flyby and this um, accelerated the space shaft by about 3,000 kilometers per hour and that was sufficient that the periapsis could jump from here to inside the rings because flying through the rings as an intermediate step this wouldn't work because the space shaft would be destroyed then. Um, here you can see this as a graph. So this is the time axis and this is the distance axis to the center of Saturn. So here the Saturn atmosphere, here are the rings, A ring, B ring, the most prominent, and then through the F ring, these were the distances of the space shaft, and then this flyby at Titan and it jumped down and you can see we were really, really close, only a few, a few thousand kilometers above Saturn. And when you have these little jumps, this is when Titan was somewhat close, then it changed it changed the periapsis a little bit and here we had another close flyby at 700,000 kilometers or so and this was sufficient to bring the periapsis down into the atmosphere and then end the mission. This looks very complicated, this gives you an impression on the plan and the complexity, so each orbit is here in the columns and here you can see uh, the names of the discipline that was uh, had the world what to do here, so Saturn here, 253, the rings were there, then the magnetosphere people, rings, rings again and so on. It was very uh, difficult um, negotiations, but at the end, as you can see, there came out a very good plan with very good results. This was the Afring orbits, that's one of the results that we were getting the propeller orbits, uh, the propeller uh, particles in the rings, so you can see why they are called propellers. They were already discovered about 10 years before, but um, now this was the first time that they could be studied at very uh, close range. So this is another object that's maybe a kilometer or so in size that is there in that already disturbs the uh, surrounding here in the ring. You can see it, there's a little bit of a very minor gap. This is from the unlit side, so here uh, this is maybe either it's opaque or that there are uh, also if there's there might be no particles at all so this might be a mix of both and here is very fine grained particle or maybe they also rise a little bit above the uh, plane of the rings which is otherwise flat. I already mentioned deafness we could come as close as never before so to get a little bit an idea how the surface is looking like and also how this um, these waves that darkness is producing, this is because its orbit is not perfectly circular but has a little bit of an eccentricity so it moves a little bit back and forth during its orbit around Saturn and this causes then these waves here and on the other side the waves are on the inner side of the ring here in the same way. And then you see uh, one wave exists there, it already begins to collapse also that's something for mathematical people, a very nice uh, playground. Also the colleagues Pan and Atlas could be observed. Atlas is a very strange appearance. Looks like there's the 
uh, some bowl in, the, uh, in between, um, like the ice cream where we have a big chocolate out here, or here for pan it's even more uh, obvious. And the reason is that it sampled very dusty ring material that was coming out. So Atlas is the first obstacle for material that the ring is losing outside, and it sampled this up and pan is somewhere inside the rings about 3,200 kilometers, has its own gap of about 270 kilometers in size, and this is also the material where it, that it was sampling. Well, for Atlas, you might have noticed that there's a little kink here. This is really there in the images, and this shows exactly the separation between the sub Saturn side, which is no, I'm sorry, because yes, it, uh, it's a, it's a the leading side and the trailing side, I think. And uh, then this means that the material on the side here is coming from back, and the material that is sampled here is coming from the other side and falling down here. This is also a very interesting uh, feature. Uh, it was realized that the outer edge of the A ring uh, is in a 7 to 6 resonance, 7 to 6 resonance to a moon called Janus. And uh, these are about, I think, 200 images which are stretched extremely in this direction here. And so this means each of these lines that you can see here is one image of uh, Cassini. And it was going around, and then you stretch it, and then, then you can see that the A ring is uh, showing this resonance with Janus. And Janus is not the only moon that causes the ring to hold and not to spread out, but it's a game of all the moons that are close to the ring, uh, out to the outer edge of the ring of Saturn, and the exact position of these moons together takes out all the momentum of the ring so that it can uh, stay stable. So maybe the moons moved around and that the current configuration only uh, came into play at the time when there was no momentum exchange anymore. Okay, and then after the F rings, the grand finale began, and you might even have noticed the Google Doodle that was uh, given at this day. It's interesting, the Cassini camera has no flashlight, and uh, there's also no way it's, it's uh, exactly, so the, the camera is uh, mounted on the spaceship, it cannot move, so selfies are unfortunately not possible, although it would be a very nice idea to do this, but it, it was the idea of Google to do that. And it's nice to see a broad audience to get attention of Cassini. This shows is another way to show how um, the space shuttle from the F ring and then the Titan flyby and then it went in the inner part within the rings and Saturn in this just two or three thousand kilometer wide gap where it went in. So the same picture for the proximal orbits as we had for the F ring. It looks a little bit less complicated, but it's uh, not a, because it was less complicated, but it's just the way the uh, uh, the cognizant people were uh, doing it, and there you can see again that different disciplines were responsible for each orbit, and then especially where you see CDA that was the dust detector and INMS at the very end this was the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, so these were really those instruments that were sniffing the material when they were coming very close to the atmosphere of Saturn. Coming between the rings and Saturn allowed uh, much higher detailed observations of the rings, of, um, of the inner rings, like the C ring. Uh, there is one part called the Maxwell ringlet and Maxwell gap, uh, very high detailed observation, uh, uh, observations now. And uh, this is our view of the area, which is in two to one uh, resonance to Janus. And since Janus is an interesting moon, it has the same orbit as Epimetheus. And these objects uh, switch their orbits every four years. And you can see this in this ring. Every four years, the, the spiral wave uh, goes in there and then moves in and in. And so you can go uh, follow this switch of these two objects over the century. So there it might be 15th, 16th century or so. Uh, these parts have been created while the newest one was created here. A really interesting question was about the mass of the rings. Um, the previous estimates were somewhere between 0.4 and 2.5 minus masses. Uh, this is, if you imagine you stand on one square meter of rings, then you would have between 10 and 50 kilograms below you. And uh, with the flybys within Saturn and the rings, uh, the expectation was that uh, this can be narrowed to 0.06 minus mi mi masses. And the obvious indication is, uh, implication is age of the rings, so how old are they? And the idea is if the rings have a low mass, then the rings should be young. If they have a large mass, they should be old simply because if they have a uh, low mass, then micrometeoroid uh, bombardment and things like that would destroy them and they would disappear and look like Uranus or Neptune's rings. 
Italian colleague uh, Luciano Yes was working on this and presented this at a meeting on September 12th. And here he said a few interesting things. One is that we could not be as uh, precise as we hoped for, only about 0.2 minus masses. These are two different methods that he was working for, but interesting it for the beam uh, ring it's always somewhere between 0.4, so this means the whole ring should have a mass probably below 1 minus mass, or in other words, the rings are likely young. And this is interesting for all those who did not believe that the rings are young and that have good arguments why they could not be, so it's a good inspiration for the ring scientists now to argue either how they can be young or why they should be old and have this low mass and so on. As you know, everybody who has its favorite science uh, finds his favorite explanations. Also interesting is the question for the rotation period of Saturn. Saturn is the third largest object in the solar system, but we don't know the rotation period. Estimates are somewhere between these two, and the idea was to measure the deviation between the magnetic field and the um, and the rotation axis, and uh, then this means that the magnetic field wobbles a little bit. And the problem was that the deviation appears to be less than 0.06 degrees or 3.6 arc minutes. And with the final observations, they said now if it deviates less than 0.015 degrees, then we can find it. But it didn't work. The magnetic field is exactly aligned to the rotation axis, and the theorists have no idea how this might really work. Maybe it is not, and in the interior of Saturn, this is a classical model, maybe there's something that is masking the magnetic field and that therefore uh, it appears to be exactly aligned to the uh, rotation period. But this is also some stuff that will hopefully be explained, explored and explained in the next years or so. Um, another problem was with the wind of Saturn, they were measured to more than 2,000 kilometers at uh, the low latitudes and there's this one model that maybe Saturn does not have a, um, a sphere, a spherical shape that is rotating, but maybe that it is uh, built up like cylinders shown here and that they have a little bit differential rotation compared to the others, which would mean that here somewhere at uh, this would uh, relate to about 30 or 40 degrees latitude that you can see a faster rotating part which is close to the equator while here when you look closer to the poles then you can see these inner cylinders which are rotating a little bit slower. But it's also a model and a theory so we will see what the next two years will bring if it will hold or if it will be replaced by a better one. Okay, now we come to the final orbit. And since it's really late, I think I will skip a little bit. I want to show you uh, some of the observations and explain how this was done, but I will um, skip this. So this was an observation, the very last observation of Saturn that was taken, uh, the, the goodbye observation, so to speak. Then uh, there was an Enceladus observation, and Enceladus was just hiding behind Saturn, so this is symbolic a little bit. Enceladus disappears for Cassini and the observations and research of Cassini for Enceladus are now ending. And then there were some more routine observations of Titan, the, of the southern aurora and of one of the propellers in the A-ring. And then the final observation that was of the impact site. So Cassini impact was somewhere here, half a day later, when this rotated into the day view, so this on the night side. And uh, a little bit funny to me was that um, when this came into, I go just back here, this is this line here, so this, this shows the, the plan. And uh, when I saw this in January this year, then I realized that this eye was not there. This means that the camera did not have an observation on this um, request. Was observation request, which was not into the plan during the negotiation, it was just added uh, after the negotiations. And then I was asking to the uh, cognizant people at JPL what's going on there, and I said, Okay, the camera people did not respond. And I said, Oh, I would like to get a picture there, so could I put something in the system? Then, okay, do it. And then I put a request in the system, so I came to the honor to make the very final observation of Cassini. It was 76 images. I had no idea, our software was not able to calculate the right exposure times. When we are on the light side. I knew that the rings are shining there, so there should be some light. I put in, okay, two seconds maybe. Then I have seen an observation in orbit 269, which had a similar geometry, and then I saw, oh, two se uh, seconds with overexposed. It means the final observation of Cassini would be overexposed. That's not a good idea. But there was still time to change this, and then I could adapt um, so that the signal to noise was right. And this is then actually the very last observation that Cassini was sending to Earth. So you can see the night side, the many clouds on the, uh, on the of Saturn's disk, and um, 
are so illuminated by the rings and here you can see a little bit the rings on the night side of Saturn. So, okay, and then the rest, the wireless here that's only antenna pointing to Earth, first to Goldstone in California and then to Canberra, to the 70 meter station in Canberra, where then still the final observation of the signal were uh, going on. Uh, still one hour before uh, impact, it was still at 60 degree north, so it came in very quickly, accelerated to more than 120,000 kilometers per hour. Then the final about 90 seconds were still very interesting. They were a new terrain because we have never been that close to the planet, so measuring the exosphere, thermosphere, uh, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen deuterium, helium, methane, temperature, pressure, ionosphere, uh, protons and so on, ring rain, materials come from the ring and so on. That was very new there and people were saying maybe two or three um, PhD uh, thesis might come out just of these 90 seconds of data. The final 10 seconds the uh, signal disappeared first in the X band and the S band called a little bit longer but then um, finally the space shaft was lost in Saturn. So this list shows uh, the so-called ACE log, the person that uh, tracks the spacecraft, and they are now the loss of signal, end of mission, and Cassini was history. About um, one and a half hours later was then made a press conference by the most uh, important people of Cassini, project manager of Mace and project scientist Linda Spilka and uh, Julie Webster, she is the engineer, the chief engineer of the spacecraft. She knows everything, every cable, every screw on the spacecraft. So then I will finish with a little bit of Cassini legacy and putting this all in a broader context. Um, we all like this kind of movies where we like to go and it's really great uh, and it's very fantastic and the fantasy of these people is great but it is not the reality. It's only imagination and it is not real. This is also an animation picture but it shows the reality. So the orbit insertion here of Cassini. In other words, what we are doing with interplanetary spacecraft is we are feeding um, the fantasy of the people and are really going, um, showing what humankind, uh, if they are brought together, can really accomplish uh, in a, in my sense, positive way. When I was going to um, the team meetings in at JPL in Pasadena, then I was always distracted by this sign on the highway because I went to Pasadena and it's great stuff what they are doing there, but I'm pretty sure that most people now. Hollywood and they do not know what's going on in Pasadena and so Hollywood is really important because um, it's, it's good for fantasy and the emotions but as I said it's not real what these people are doing there and then about a mile before JPL there was this sign here and this, this is a soccer stadium with 94,000 people fit in and I think uh, from the uh, championship 94, the final was going on there. Not sure if it has a meaning that this sign is a little bit bigger than this sign here. But uh, so you can see there's a different uh, view on the world depending if you go left or right. Very nice it that Cassini had a lot of international participation and the uh, the mission leaders always show this new graph when they are giving presentations showing that it's not just an American effort but it's really a worldwide effort and this is something where uh, the spacecraft is also the International Space uh, Station and uh, many of the activities in space they are really worldwide or at least have the potential and I'm not sure if there are a lot of other things that are going worldwide that way except maybe for soccer or so. What uh, remains from Cassini? The space shuttle itself is mixed with Saturn on a molecular basis, but the Titan probe is still there, so in case uh, you send another space shuttle to Titan and pick it up, then you can bring it back and put it in the Smithsonian Museum, so maybe in a hundred years or so. Already now, these are thousands of scientific papers, or here an example of some books that have already been published. There are three that will come in 2018. This one, for instance, is in will come in June, this one, end of February. So if you're interested in the rare high-level details, then these books are the first address to go there. What particularly important is, is a paradigm, 
paradigm change uh, in the view where there might be life in the universe. So far we thought it's within the so-called habitable zones around stars, but with Cassini we learned that maybe much more of the biomass in the universe might be within oceans of moons of planets. So it's not uh, restricted to the habitable zone where the temperatures are right and where life can live on the surface, but it's really a uh, part that is well uh, sheltered against the environment of some hostile stars or whatever, heat or uh, cold or whatever. I have shown this at the beginning. Uh, this was the launch of Cassini, but maybe more interesting, I thought, this kind of pictures we can see in the, in the internet or so, more interesting is taking pictures in the other direction. So, with your colleagues, um, just a second before launch and then a second after launch. So it's really, Cassini is a machine, but it's really the humans that are behind it. And this is maybe showing this in a nice way where the faces of the Huygens and of the Cassini scientists are projected on the space shaft. Um, so Cassini is a machine, but it's uh, the humans that are behind it. And Cassini represents the hopes and dreams of the Cassini scientists and engineers and support staff. staff. And uh, it's an international team of scientists and they have now uh, many of them have known each other for more than two decades, so it's really a lifelong effort as well. It's also for the major public, so there was for instance an activity on July 19, 2013, it was called Wave to Saturn. This was the picture that Cassini was taken on this day. Uh, the sun was behind Saturn, and that was the reason why the cameras were allowed to look into the direction of the sun, because, of the sun because it was blocked. Here you can see a lot of objects and one is of particular interest. I guess you already know what it is here. So this is our Earth and the Moon. So at this time it was America pointing, the American continent pointing to Cassini. And then the idea was when Cassini is photographing the Earth, then wave and say hello. And there were indeed thousands of postcards. You can see these little spots there. There's a lot of postcards that were sent then to NASA showing people that were waving to Saturn at the time when the space shuttle was imaging the Earth. So this leads me to the final question. We now have more than 50 years of space research with, uh, of, of planetary research with spacecraft. What is the really, really most important result of this 50 years of efforts? You can see here a picture how we can see the planets with no uh, support, so no um, telescope or binocular or whatever. So the planets here, they appear just as dots only the moon and the sun can be seen uh, a little bit larger than a dot. Of course the spacecraft bring us close and they show us how these objects are looking like from very close. So, And this is not even the closest view of Saturn. We get not even much closer and in particular to the moons. But um, in my view the really really important thing that we learned from the spacecraft is the view back to Earth. Nowhere else are the environmental conditions for us humans even remotely comparable to those on our home planet. The spacecraft have shown that there is no second Earth within our solar system and that all other planets are either too cold, too hot, too massive, have no atmosphere, have no oxygen and so on. The space outside the Earth is completely hostile to humans and the Earth is the only planet where humans can live. We conquered the whole Earth now, the humans, and now there is nothing else that we might make accessi accessible to us as we did with, for instance, the United uh, the Americas or with Australia or whatever. And the undamped growing comes to an end that we lived for centuries and the results from the space probes are really clear on that. I think that's a very important message, but unfortunately it's not really understood by everyone. So this brings me to an end and if you want I can show you still a two minutes long movie that compiles uh, the results of Cassini, a little bit with music if you want. And if you want then still I have another four minute long, but uh, we really have to make a vote on this one here. So, okay, hope it works, the speakers.
Vielen Dank. So, many thanks, Tilman, for this fantastic talk, for this fantastic overview of what the Cassini intelligence has discovered in uh, the Sunspin system. So, I see the first hand up. Uh, I can repeat so, a question. One of the arguments why the probe at the time of the edge of the second atmosphere was that it could not uh, contaminate any of the moons. However, the Huygens uh, probe must have been sterile in order to land on Titan. How is it possible to have um, Huygens sterile and uh, the Cassini probe not? <coughs> okay, did everyone hear the question? That's about uh, why uh, there was an argument about this, uh, the not sterile Cassini spacecraft had to be entered in the Saturn's atmosphere, while the Huygens probe that was not really sterilized uh, that much could land on Titan and survive there. Um, I think Huygens was a little bit more clean than Cassini. I'm not sure if it was completely clean, but likely not. Um, the idea that there might be life on the moons of Saturn or within the moons of Saturn, even within Titan, it emerged just when the Huygens mission has already been accomplished. So it was a little bit of a luck. If we would have known before, I'm not sure if they would have given other uh, restrictions to Huygens before launch. So maybe that would have been the case. But let me think. The Huygens probe was there was a, a mishap when it was already on the launch pad and then they had to remove the whole spacecraft, bring it back to the assembly hall, open this uh, golden uh, fol foliage, uh, clean the spacecraft, the Huygens probe, and then put it back. And they, I'm sure they did not um, sterilize. So Huygens was not sterilized in this case. So it, it was the, the right time coincidence. So next question. Speaking of enchiladas, uh, the hydrogen of uh, events uh, uh, and the possibility of life uh, originating in uh, the water. Are exobiologists still in the same? Uh, are they investigating these conditions in the laboratory or what's the Okay, the question is a little bit about how to explore if there might be life on Enceladus. So it's a very complicated question. Um, there is even a journal called Astrobiology. I think it exists for a few years where uh, if you look for it, then you might probably find a very dedicated answer. Um, there are uh, different aspects. One is uh, looking for the habitability of an area, then uh, looking if there is the right chemistry there, and then looking if there's the right physical and uh, other conditions like um, energy sources and things like that. And with the Cassini spacecraft, it was just possible to take, detect the hydrogen, to detect silica, um, SeO2, in the plumes, and to derive joint with laboratory experiments that have been done by uh, Heidelberg colleague Frank Postberg, um, and where they detected that there must have been, when these particles originated, very high temperatures, about 90 degrees Celsius or so. And so they combined what is known from the laboratory, what is known from theory, with the little, little bit of what was known from the ion and mass spectrometer and the dust detector of Cassini. And then they, um, the conclusion is that there might be life, but we need another mission that has more sophisticated uh, um, scientific instruments, especially if you have a very good mass spectrometer that can measure the uh, consistence of the plume of these eruptions and if you can detect amino acids or things like that that would be a major progress and i think the nasa also has uh, proposals out there people can uh, um, uh, um, uh, they have an offer that people can even bring in proposal for a, a mission that might cost about a billion dollars or something like so so not as expensive as cassini that was almost four billion dollars and one idea would be really to send a space shuttle through the plumes that can do these highly sophisticated measurements. There was also an idea that someone wants to make a microscopic observations of catch particles and things like that, but that's very difficult because the flyby speed is so and trapping them is difficult. That was a little bit a mixed answer. I'm not sure if it is satisfying for you, but um, that's what I know at the moment. So next question now with microphone. Second trick. 
thanks for the interesting talk. I have two questions. One is a technical. What is a typical time scale to transmit one uh, photo from Cassini to Earth? What is like typical time scale? Uh, and the second question is, uh, did uh, these Cassini uh, photos in different filters? What was or it was just single filter? Oh. And, and what about like colors like in this photo? Is it like an artificial colors or? Okay, the uh, light time from Saturn to Earth is between 75 and 85 minutes. So that was all the time. So when we are close to opposition, the Earth is in between the Sun and Saturn, then it was 75 minutes and when it was on the other side and the Sun was in between Saturn and the Earth, then it was about 85 minutes. In other words, when we had a downlink that was usually nine hours long, the downlink of the data, then there was enough time if there was the information that something went wrong with the spacecraft to uh, prepare a command or maybe to use a pre-prepared command and send it to the spacecraft on the same tracking uh, time to, to make a little bit of a communication. But not very much, but a little bit. And it did not happen very often, but a few times that the responsible people were waken, woken up at three o'clock in the night. Uh, one case was particularly bad. There was a message, the space draft is not there. <laughs> and it, is, it was on my birthday and it also had data from me that were lost then. But then they realized with another antenna that they brought up that there was a carrier signal there. And um, so it was not the space draft lost, just, but just the so-called ultra-stable oscillator that was used. And so the frequency was out and the space draft didn't even realize that this was wrong. It was just sending the data and they were not received on Earth. And then since then it was 2012 or 11 or so. And then the space draft had to live without. This was complicated a little bit, some science, but it worked. Okay, another question about the color filters on the camera. This is a quite old camera. The design was from 1991. So it... Uh, it was not as capable as our um, smartphone cameras are today, at least from the sensor. The optics was better, of course, because smartphone is all the electronics that makes the pictures more or less good. And it has um, um, pixel, division, pixel division of uh, 4096, so it was a 12-bit camera, not 16 as is usual, and also not the 8-bit that our cameras have with the free filters. So we have 3 by 3 times 8-bit usually on our cameras. And um, it was only monochromatic, um, sensible from 300 something nanometers to about 1000 nanometers. And then there were two filter wheels um, that they could combine. And we identified about four different combination of color filters. And one that was called the clear filter, that means that uh, the whole light more or less goes through on the sensor. And this was for both cameras, for the narrow angle camera and for the wide angle camera, but the wide angle camera, it was a, not a Cassegrain reflector, but it was a lens telescope. It was a spare from the Voyagers from the 1980s. So a really old thing. And um, there the, break, uh, the, the light could not go through in the ultraviolet. So it started somewhere in the violet uh, wavelength, but also went up to a thousand nanometers and the electronic and the CCD sensor was the same. The size of the CCD sensor was 1024 by 1024, so 1 million pixels, not that great, but we were close. So it's time for two very short questions. So, first yeah, I hope it's also a simple question. Um, for the naming of the moons, what is the convention that you have? I mean, I saw a lot of strange names. Does it belong to a mythology or uh, what names can you give to these moons? Uh, um, that depends for the inner moons. It's mainly the, from the from the Greek um, mythology. So um, Tethys, Dione, Rhea. These were not the children of Saturn because Saturn ate his children. <laughs> so, it, so it were the, the, the brothers and sisters of Saturn, and they were a part of a group of the Titans. And then another. Um, part, family, whatever it's called, were called giants. They were fighting against the titans. So they were um, Mimas and Enceladus, for instance. They were some of the giants and they were named. Um, this bluish one here, except for Phoebe, they were named in the mid 19th century by 
John Herschel, the son of William Herschel. Um, he was the first who invented names to the satellites there, and he thought that um, because Saturn has to do, okay, Saturn is with the Greek, uh, with the Roman mythology, but uh, he gave them names from the um, Greek mythology to these objects. This was followed then later with these other smaller objects as well. For Helene, I know it was discovered from two French astronomers in 1980s, and to my knowledge, both have daughters with the name Hélène. And I uh, might be a coincidence there. And then for the irregular satellites, they were discovered by French Canadian colleagues and uh, Kiviuk Ichirak, um, Paliak, and so on. These are from the Inuit mythology, except for Paliak. This was from a modern novel from 2006 where uh, the discoverer and the author, they just uh, put this into the list of the proposed name in the International Astronomical Union, which is responsible for them, accepted this name. And then others like Eriapus or Albiorix, this is from uh, Gallic mythology. Um, so it's the French part, and then uh, Greip, Mundilfari, and Fenrir and so on, that is also from northern um, goddesses. So, um, very quick question. Question or answer? <laughs> Both. <laughs> uh, when the Huygens uh, spacecraft descended on Titan, uh, I seem to recall that one of the cameras failed. Did that, um, was that so, and did that limit the scientific goals? Um, it was not one of the cameras that failed. The cameras worked well, but uh, they were, there were two channels that were sending the data to the Cassini spacecraft, which received the data from Huygens. Uh, and one of these of the receivers on board of Cassini was not turned on, so they only got data from one. In other words, the idea of doing redundancy was a great one, because it was really needed, only one channel worked. And then all instruments had the option should you, you might send all your data simultaneously on both channels. Then in the case that one um, channel will not send data, you will not lose anything. And the other was, you can take twice as many data sent on the different channel, different data, and if one is lost, then you just get half of it. And this was done by the camera people, so they lost half of the pictures, but if they would have taken the other strategy, they would have lost half of the pictures also because not, it was not planned to take all this. And there was another funny thing, the Huygens probe rotated, and then it stopped rotating, rotated in the other direction, because some parts of the instruments were not modeled correctly for the aerodynamics. And since the camera was triggered by the sun, there was a sun sensor, and all, when the sun came in, then it, the camera knew that it had to take a picture, more or less that way, and when it rotated the other way around, then it was confused somehow, and then the pictures were taken there and there and there, and it was not really well organized, but at the end, it got nice mosaic, anyway. So, with that remark, let us thank Tillman for this very, very nice talk about uh, Cassini and Saturn and the system of rings and moons. Many thanks. Okay.